gives way to darkest night Your spirit still is here And though my strength fades like the light New mercies will appear I rest in have a seat. Thank you, team. All right. We are in our discipleship series, learning how to follow Jesus Christ correctly as disciples. And in this side, inside this study, uh, we've been doing it for several months now and we'll continue for a while. Uh, we are in the section, be ready to give a reason for your hope, to be able to explain to people what we believe and why we believe it. We are instructed to do so in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you. And so we should be able to talk to people what we believe and why we believe it. And we've been going over multiple subjects so far. We have now, are now in the section of millions of years. This is a very important subject. A lot of churches would like to stay away from it because... There are lies out in our culture that are taught as fact and they go against what the Word of God says and so they have eroded faith in the Word of God which has eroded a lot of people's faith and it's caused a lot of people not to have faith in God. So that's why we're dealing with this subject because it actually counters exactly opposite what the Bible teaches Last week, we looked at the Big Bang Theory that says the universe was 13.5 billion years old and that the universe came into existence from nothing with no purpose, no meaning, and no intelligence behind it. That it took millions of years for stars and planets to form and eventually life appeared from dead material. There was no life and then there was the life. The inorganic to the organic world. How did life just come up from dead material? How did life arise? Well, you'll be amazed how they explain the origin of life millions of years ago. Play the next video, please. For me, it is. When I learned that I am the same as the trees, as the grass, as the other animals in this biosphere held by Earth, I'm not separate and apart from them. I'm the same. I am uplifted because I am the same, mm. not because I'm different. The atoms of your body are traceable to stars that manufactured them in the core, in the crucibles of, of the thermonuclear fusion inside the cores of stars. And these stars exploded, scattered these elements across the galaxy into the next generation gas clouds that then collapsed, formed star systems with ingredients that can now make planets, with planets that now have ingredients that can now make life. Mm. We are alive in this universe. And because our atoms are traceable to the universe itself, the universe is alive within us. You are special, not because you're different from the universe. You are special because you are the same as the universe. To me, that borders on spiritual. We are not figuratively, but literally stardust. That's beautiful. Really? Sounds like they got it all figured out, don't they? 
Do you know that everything he said, there is no scientific evidence whatsoever? None. Zilch. It's all his imagination. But that's not how they presented it, do they? The formation of systems, star systems, planets, the moon, all from his imagination. But do you understand that when you listen to that, if you have studied religions of the world, the occult, there are a lot of things he said that's coming straight out of New Age mysticism, Hinduism, Buddhism, and pantheism. all combined to form a secular, modern secular religion masquerading as science. Because everything he said, you have to take by faith, blind faith, because there's no evidence. We do not have blind faith as believers. God has given us lots of evidence. That is what we've been talking about for several weeks now. But theirs is blind faith when it comes to the origin of the universe and of life. Here's what they actually say. Next slide. Big Bang Theory relies on a growing number of hypothetical entities, things that we have never observed. Inflation. Remember when the universe inflated? Inflation, dark matter, dark energy are the most prominent. Without them, there would be fatal contradictions in their Big Bang Theory. Next slide. You may have noticed that despite of these brave words, I have not explained the origin of the universe. The reason, of course, is that this is a matter about which scientists still have no clear idea of how things came to be. The inflation debate, the next one, Levi, is the theory at the heart of modern cosmology deeply flawed. And this is not coming from a Christian scientist but they're realizing that the cosmic egg, remember what was explained in the video, there was no outside, but there was inside this molten mass of energy and everything that then inflated. They call it the cosmic egg. Where did that cosmic egg come from? You have a chicken in the egg problem with the universe. In reality, next slide, Levi, something from nothing is totally absurd. Never been observed in the universe. You have nothing, you get nothing. Origin, cosmic egg, unknown to them. Origin of moon, stars, unknown. Origin of the solar system, unknown. Origin of stars and galaxies, unknown. The Big Bang, nothing was there, nothing exploded for no purpose, no intelligence behind it, nothing. It's myth. You have to accept it by blind faith. We believe there was nothing there in the beginning. Then God said, there's a cause. The cause is God. And we've given you the evidence in the past of why we believe the universe is precisely designed, that God is behind it. But their faith, what they tell you to believe in, stardust, it's not scientific. It's not testable. It's not observable. It's not provable. Just faith, and stardust, not God. Why? Because they don't want there to be a God because they don't want to be told how to live their lives. So we come back to the question, where did millions of years come from? Because if the earth is not millions of years old, then why should we believe the universe is 13.5 billion years old? And some say it should be trillions. That's the new philosophy coming out that it should be literally trillions of years old. Where did millions of years come from? Well, where are you taught millions of years today? Where are you taught? Who teaches it? Science. Science teaches it, right? So the question is, when did science start claiming millions of years? Well, to find that, you need to ask another question. When did science first begin? Now, if you go Google that, they bring up Aristotle. 
He's the first one that showed, started using scientific principles, right? But Aristotle did not believe in millions of years. Aristotle believed the universe was eternal. It always existed. But we do know from good science that the universe did have a beginning. So Aristotle was wrong in thinking it was eternal. So when did modern science begin past Aristotle? Aristotle was kind of given the, 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 he was pushing it forward. But when did modern science begin? It's actually listed at 1729 by a guy named James Bradley. But who really established science? The father of science. That's listed as Galileo, the father of science. He lived between 1564 and 1642. What kind of man was Galileo? He said this, all truths are easy to understand once they are discovered. The point is to discover them. So we see one thing about Galileo. He was on a truth quest. Not a happiness quest. Most people in the world are on a happiness quest. He was on a truth quest. He also said, in the sciences, the authority of thousands of, thousands of opinions is not worth as much as one tiny spark of reason in an individual man. The world is flat. Most people believe that, right? At the time, back in 1492, right? Before Columbus set sail on the ocean, blue, That happens a lot in science. Sometimes you have science, all these, you have a big majority of scientists say, this is what we believe. This is true. And then you have a small minority that say, no. And they're using reason, and this is using groupthink. Galileo suffered from that. That happened to him because he's the one that came out and said, the earth does not evolve around, or the sun does not evolve around the earth. He was persecuted for that. He also said, I do not feel obligated to believe that the same God who has endowed us with sense, reason, and intellect has intended us to forego their use. That's good. He's a believer in God. He said, the laws of nature are written in the hand, by the hand of God in the language of mathematics. And we talked about that. The mathematically precise universe. How all the laws are mathematically precise equations. That doesn't come from an explosion of nothingness. It calls from intelligence. He says God created it in the language of mathematics. So Galileo believed an intelligent design of the universe by God. He also said this, God is known by nature in his works and by doctrine in his revealed word. Creation proclaims the glory of God and the Bible reveals who he is. Galileo believed in the beginning, according to the Word of God, and Galileo believed in the timeline, in the beginning of the sciences, in the age of enlightenment, and they, majority of them believed in the timeline of the Bible. It was, it was common. 6,000-year-old earth, not millions. So when did science start believing in millions of years? Because it didn't start out that way. Well, then you have to go forward about 100 years after the death of Galileo. 100 years after his death. You have a guy named James Hutton. Now, he's considered the father of geology. He said, if the secession of worlds is established in the system of nature, it is vain to look for anything higher in the origin of the earth. The results, therefore, of our present inquiry is that we find no vestige of, the, of a beginning, no prospect of an end. Nature. This is the rise, about 100 years after Galileo, this is the rise of the modern times. Modernism. It's about reasoning, but without God in the picture. Man is starting to reason for himself. And putting God out of the picture. And so you have this rise of this 
looking at the natural realm, and that's all there is. There's nothing higher than the universe. There's nothing outside of the universe. And God is outside of time, space, and matter, but they're not going to look to it anymore. You see, from his personal writings, James Hutton questioned God's existence, questioned the accuracy of the Bible. Next slide, Levi. Another of Hutton's key concept was the theory of uniformitarianism. This was the belief that geological forces that work in the present day, barely noticeable to the human eye, yet immense in their impact, are the same as those that operate in the past. It became evident from such analysis that enormous lengths of time were required to account for the thickness of exposed rock layers. We've talked about the rock layers, didn't we, during the flood. Uniformitarianism, I'll finish that later. Geological, so he's saying basically the geological forces, erosions, volcano, earthquake, wind, that all shows that over a long period of time, those forces can create the rock layers. But it's so such a slow process that you have to have a long period of time to create those rock layers. It, uniformitarianism totally dismisses the Bible, including the account of the worldwide flood. Hutton saw the rock layers as long periods of time. Uniformitarianism is a theory that has no place in it for God, just natural processes. No place for catastrophe to happen on a global scale. Uniformitarianism says... All things continue as they have in the past. There's no change. The way it was then is the way it is now. And that's the way it's going to be. This was spoken of by Peter in 2 Peter chapter 3. Knowing this first, that scoffers will come in the last days, scoffing at the Bible, scoffing at who God is, walking according to their own lust, and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep... All things continue as they were from the beginning. Uniformitarianism. Peter spoke about this 1,600 years before Hutton came up with uniformitarianism. Last days, they'll come up with this theory. Next slide, Levi. There it says at the end of that paragraph, uniformitarianism is one of the fundamental principles of earth sciences today. This theory is still in play. Very much so. It's a fundamental principle of earth science today. Next slide. Hutton's theory is about to a frontal attack on a popular contemporary school of thought called catastrophism. The belief that only natural catastrophes such as the Great Flood could count for the form and nature of a 6,000-year-old earth. The great age of the earth was the first revolutionary concept to emerge from the new science of geology. So up until then, they looked at the world, the scientists did, according to the Bible, and they saw evidence for a great flood. All those rock layers happened in a short period of time. Flood can do that. But this new train of thought was no, 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 not a catastrophe. Millions of years form those rock layers. We've already looked at all the evidence to prove they weren't formed over millions of years, but that's what this theory talks about. Now, unfortunately, Hutton was not a very good writer. While his paper of 1785 suggested an entirely new theory of geomorphology, the study of landforms and their development, it was the 19th century scholar Sir Charles Lyell, whose Principles of Geology book and published in 1830 popularized the concept of uniformitarianism. So here's a good picture of Charles uh, Lyell there um, and his book that he wrote in 1830. A little background on this man. He was a lawyer. That should tell you enough. Not a scientist. He was a lawyer. 
He was an atheist. And he hated God. And he most importantly hated the Word of God, the Bible. In his book, you can read his view on God's Word. Even though at the time, it was harder to do than it is today. Today, you can openly despise this book. Back then, you had to be a little careful, but he, he was really pushing it. So in his book on page 30, Principles of Geology 1830, he wrote this, false conclusions, futile reasoning based on ancient doctrine, sanctioned by the implicit faith of many generations and supposed to rest on scriptural authority. He's downplaying the role this plays in man's beliefs. Next one, he said, men of superior talent who thought for themselves. How many of you guys have ever run into an atheist or agnostic and you ask them why they don't believe in God and they say, well, I finally started thinking for myself. You guys ever run into that? Yeah, I have, multiple times. It's the old atheist saying. Basically, it's a put down for you. Basically, they're saying people who believe in God are not thinking. And they used to believe when they weren't thinking, but now that they think for themselves, they don't believe. Well, he wrote this, men of superior talent who thought for themselves and were not blinded by authority, the authority of God's word. You see, this is the authority. This is the word of God. This is the authority over every human being, whether they realize it or not. It's the authority over this church. It's my authority as a pastor. Charles Lyle hated that authority. Lyle said his goal was to free the science from Moses. Quoted for saying that many times. What does that mean? Well, Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible, and he wrote Genesis 1, the creation account. And Genesis describes an earth that's around 6,000 years old, not millions of years. He wanted to get the Bible out of science. And we've shown you how much science is in this book. Yeah, there's miracles which science seems to have a problem with, but there is so much good science, and I showed you that when we went through how do we know the Bible is the Word of God. There was more science in here than science knew before science was. <sighs> Lyle was primarily responsible for giving in his book the world, the concept, and I say concept, of the geological column, where each rock layer was given a name like Jurassic, an age, and an index fossil long before dating techniques were available in 1830. The geological column accepted purely by faith is the Bible for the evolutionists. Lyle dismissed the evidence for a biblical flood. So in 1830, long before scientific evidence, Ge uh, Lyle presented the geological column. Next slide, Levi. He looked at the layers of the earth and said, no, that didn't happen with a catastrophe. That happened over millions and millions of years. So he formed the column based on the false theory of uniformitarianism that denies God and denies catastrophe catastrophic flood of Noah. Lyle created the geological column of rock layers. He gave the layers an age based on his imagination, based on the theory of uniformitarianism. He gave the rock layers the ages, picked them out of the clear blue sky, no scientific way of dating anything in 1830. Basically, he lied. No column exists because no millions of years. Even the index fossils that are in each layer is a, is a lie, and I'll show you that here in a second. You see, these layers, according to Lyle, are supposed to represent every age of the Earth's history. So if that is truly the case, we should find all these layers all around the world. Because the world has experienced those ages at one time, right? 
But that's not what we find. Next slide, Levi. What we find is, when we look at the layers around the world, 77% of the Earth's Earth is missing seven layers of the geological column. 94, three layers, and 99.6 is missing at least one layer. Why? Because the layers are not laid down during the ages of the earth. They were laid down in a catastrophic flood, and floods are not uniform. They are chaotic and destructive. Geological calm does not exist, and school books used to say that. School books used to have the truth. Back in the 80s, says this. This is from a school book. If there were a column of sediments deposited continu continuously since the formation of the earth, the entire history of the planet could be re re gosh, reconstructed. Unfortunately, no such column exists. Where sediments are missing, a break in the sedimentary record occurs. Breaks result in gaps in the record that may range from a few years to hundreds of millions of years. That's kind of a big gap. A few years, hundreds of millions. Here's a picture of the textbook, right out of the page of the textbook. Next slide, Levi. 80 to 85% of the Earth's land surface does not even have three geological periods appearing in correct consecutive order. It becomes an overall exercise of gigantuan special pleading and imagination for the evolutionary uniformitarianism paradigm to maintain that there ever were geological periods. If you notice, this is a geologist who wrote that. Only a few locations on Earth, about 0.4%, have been described with a succession of the 10 systems beneath it. Even where the 10 systems may be present, geologists recognize individual systems to be incomplete. The entire geological column composed of complete strata systems exists only in the diagrams drawn by geologists. The geological column is supposed to represent a vertical cross-section through the Earth's crust with the most recently deposited, therefore youngest rocks at the surface, and the oldest, earliest rocks deposited on a crystalline basement rocks at the bottom. If one wishes to check out this standard column, where can he go to see it for himself? There is only one place in all the world to see the standard geological column. That is in the textbooks. Finally, Warren D. Allman, director of the Paleontological Research Institution at Cornell University. This is what he said about Lyle and his book from 1830. Lyle also sold geology some snake oil. He convinced geologists that all past processes act as it, acted as essentially their current rates, uniformitarianism, this extreme gradualism has led to numerous unfortunate consequences, including the rejection of sudden or catastrophic events in the face of positive evidence for them, i.e., the evidence we showed you about the flood. So when looking at this geological column, next slide, Levi, It's not real. None of it. Yes, the world is layered, but that's because of a flood. That happens in every flood. But when you have a worldwide flood, that's going to leave layers worldwide, but they're not going to be uniform. They're going to be chaotic. They're not going to match. It's all going to be different. The layers of rock can be dated by which fossils are found in them. All right, relative timing, they try to figure out the relative date. And it's about the fossils, the organisms found in the rock layers. Layers dated by the fossils in them, called index fossils. So how do they today age the layer of rock? There are three main principles in determining the age of a rock layer today. For relative age is superposition, cross-cutting relationships, 
and index fossils. We're going to focus on index fossils, but let me tell you what the others were. Super, uh, superposition is the rocks on the layers on the bottom are older than the rocks on, la- on top because, of course, our uniformitarianism, the rock layers are being formed over the ages. So the rocks on the bottom are older. All right? But a flood can lay down many layers, as we've talked about the evidence for a worldwide flood. Then you got the cross-cutting relationship where basically you have un- unconformities and that messes up the layer. So the unconformity must be younger than the layer, common sense. But how do you get those unconformities? It's got to have some sort of catastrophic event there to mess up the layer. But here's the real way they do it, by index fossils. Relative age is the age of the rock layer for the fossil it contains compared to other layers. It can be determined by looking at the position of rock layers. Absolute age is the numeric age of the rock layer, which is usually done by radiocarbon dating. We will get to that next week because that, well, I'll show you. But what they mainly do is the index fossils will tell you how old a rock layer is, okay? So going back to this geological column, which is a lie by Charles Lyell, you can tell the age of the rock layer by the index fossil. And then you can tell the age of the fossil by which layer it's found in. It's called circular reasoning. But these index fossils are a lie. Because many of the fossils that they use as index fossils are still alive today. Let me show you. The lobe fin fish are the index fossil for rock layer that is 325 to 410 million years old. But we still have them swimming in the ocean today. So what does that mean? If uniformitarianism is correct, these fish could be fossils in every rock layer because they're still alive today. And just a little side note, these fish were the ones that were supposed to have climbed out of the water. They crawled out of the water millions of years ago, and these are our great, 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 great ancestors. They crawled out of the water, evolutionary process, and eventually land animals were formed. There's something fishy about that, yeah. Good one, man, that's a good one. Crazy. But here's another one. Oh, gra- graptolites. I guess that's how you spell it, say it. Graptolites. Are the index fossil for rock layer that's 410 million years old. But guess what? They're still swimming in the ocean today. So they could be in every rock layer. The index fossil is the main way to age rock layers for relative dating at kind of getting a ballpark figure. And then if you want to age, get a ballpark figure of how old the rock layer is, you look for the index fossil in it. It's circular reasoning. And then you come up with this problem. How do you tell the difference between 100 million year old Jurassic limestone and 600 million year old Cambrian limestone? Because it's all limestone. You have to look for the index fossil. But we just realized those index fossils can be found in all the layers. Some of them are still around today. Folks, they do not use radiocarbon dating to age the rock layers. I said we'll get to that next week. But here's what I want to show you in the last 10 minutes that I have with you. So why is it important to know the link from Hutton questioning the authority of this, kind of denying it, not wanting to pay attention to it, questioning it when he formed his theory of uniformitarianism that the Bible warned us about in the first century? to Lyle taking that theory and basing his geological column on it and his open 
likeness to despising the word of God. Why do I share this with you? Well, it's going to lead to one more interesting character. But before I reveal who that character is, let me show you this real quick. Number one, Charles Lyell's presupposition, his worldview, was to first hate the word of God and then seek out another explanation for the earth's history. Meaning he was not converted by the evidence, but his heart was already corrupted against the God of the Bible. Why? Well, again, Peter tells us, knowing this first as scoffers, those who will scoff at the Bible, scoff at God, deny him, will come in the last days walking according to their own lusts. And I've talked to a lot of atheists and I've listened to a lot of atheists being interviewed. And many of them say, I'm not going to have some God tell me how to live my life. They believe what they believe. They believe, they'd rather believe in stardust than God because they're driven by their own desires to live their life the way they want to. Number two, Charles Lyell, along with a couple other people, created the geological column. Lyell is the main architect. Created the geological column from pure hypothetical imagination based on a false theory of uniformitarianism that rejects God in the picture. So folks, this right here, we were all taught this in school, you grow up with it. Now, I did find, like I said, I found one textbook that actually was honest, but most of the textbooks were not honest even back then, and they're definitely not honest today. They don't tell the kids this is not really what you see in nature. And when you look at the index fossils, those are lies. Clams and everything and low uh, sea creatures, you know, we find on the bottom are are listed as index fossils from way back when, but of course they're going to be buried first in a flood. It's not proving evolution that we came from these slimy things and got, slowly got better. This is, this is a lie from top to bottom. In 1830, there was no scientific means whatsoever to test the age of, of anything. So how did he come up with such precise ages for each layer? From his imagination, period, based on the false theory of uniformitarianism. Charles Lyell's book of 1830 was able to influence a young preacher fresh out of college named Charles Darwin. Charles Darwin, when he went on his, he couldn't get hired by a church because he was a terrible theologian because he wasn't even a believer, but he went to seminary. He had a seminary. He's not a scientist. We're going to get to more about this when we get to evolution. But when he went on his trip to the Galapagos Islands, he took two books. He took his Bible. And he took Principles of Geology, 1830. He said in his own writing, as he read Charles Lyell's book, his faith in the word of God slowly eroded. And by the time he was done with his trip, he no longer believed in the word of God. That's what Charles Lyell's book did. Now, if Charles Lyell's book was based on real scientific evidence and we had good reason not to believe this, okay, fine. But it's not. It's based on his imagination. There's no scientific evidence whatsoever. But Charles Lyell lost his faith in the word of God because of Charles Lyell's book, and that led to this. Next slide. Three men. These three men have probably deceived more people in human history than anybody else. It started with Hutton questioning 
the existence of God and creating uniformitarianism. Charles Lyell took that theory and he expanded on it. He created the geological column, which is not found in nature. He added the millions of years to each layer in 1830, and he's the one, based on Hutton, that created millions of years in the newly formed science called earth science and geology. And from that point on, it taught the earth is millions of years old. That is where millions of years came from. Not scientific evidence, but from the mind of Charles Lyell, who hated God and hated the word of God. Then Charles Darwin read his book, lost his faith in... Nope, yeah, you faith, that's fine. Charles Darwin read his book, lost his faith in the Bible, and took the millions of years from Charles Lyell that don't exist, and he based his theory of evolution on those millions of years because you have to have millions of years for evolution to take place if evolution is true, and we will talk about evolution coming up. Go back one, Levi. I want you to take a look at these men. We have their personal writings. They're not men of integrity. They're not good men. They're sinful men who are in the right place at the right time for Satan to use to bring about one of the greatest lies in human history, evolution. And evolution at its very core, if you really study it, evolution says there is no God. We're here by natural processes. You're not accountable to God. It teaches everything opposite of this. It's from the mind of the father of lies, Satan himself. And he used these three men who were driven by their own lust to deceive the entire world. And today, I know a lot of people would mock me and make fun of me because they believe the earth is millions of years old and the universe is 13.5 billion years old and it all came from nothing. And we are stardust. Folks, millions of years is from these three guys. Well, the first two. Then evolution is from Darwin. Real quick as I close, I got two minutes. Go to the next slide. All right, so we're going to get to this book again later, Origin of Species by Charles Darwin. Again, if millions of years don't exist and they don't, then you don't have time for evolution. So evolution right there disproves evolution, but we'll go farther into it. We'll go into all the science, science of destroying evolution. But I want, you, I want to make the connection between Lyle and Darwin. It's not just Darwin hearing about the millions of years and taking it. No, no, no. Charles Lyell was Darwin's hero. I'm going to show you a video of Darwin's office in his home. I think it's in London, around London. But now it's a museum. Darwin's home is now a museum, all dedicated to the great man himself who brought us the theory of evolution. So this video is scanning his office because it's, wow, this is where the origin of species was written based on millions of years from Charles Lyell, based on uniformitarianism from Hutt. Why don't you watch this video? Go. See the picture in the very middle by the fireplace? Elevated over the other two. Do you notice who picture that is? Click one time, Levi. It's Charles Lyle, centered on his fireplace. If you want to come up, I know it may be hard for you to see from where you are. If you want to come up, I'll show you a close-up version after. He dedicated many of his books to Lyle. 
The connection is there. Satan used Hutton. Satan used Lyle. And then Satan used Darwin to create the most racist, God-hating, God-rejecting, nasty theory of evolution. That's the nicest thing I can say about it. It's a lie, folks. But they're teaching it as fact in school and universities. Now you say as we close, what about radiocarbon dating? I thought they radiocarbon dated everything and that proves millions of years old. All right, we'll go over that next week. And does the Bible teach millions of years? So next week we should be able to finish up this subject, but uh, come back next week for radiocarbon dating and I will show you the major problems with radiocarbon dating. Major problems. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I hate that the truth of what the truth has been hijacked. I hate that three men driven by their lust, their sinful nature, who wanted to reject you, reject your authority, Satan was able to use them to deceive millions of people. Billions, maybe. They take your glory away from your design, your creation, your artistry, and they credit it to nothing. And the amazing life that you created, including us, you said we are fearfully and wonderfully made, Lord, and the human body, all life is, but the human body, is just amazing how you designed it. But they want to credit stardust. Lord, they want to take and strip everything away from you. The truth, your, the credit you deserve, the glory you deserve. And they've ruined people's faith in your word. And they've ruined people's faith in you. And now people live separated from you with no fear of your judgment. And they've been blinded by the lies of a couple of men. Lord, I ask you to help us to share with people who might believe in millions of years and who scoff at the Bible to take a second look at what's really going on in the world. I ask you to help us as believers to trust your word. To know it's true. To test it to try it and let it prove itself and take that word and that truth to people who are lost people who no longer have a fear of God because there is no God according to the science it's just the universe just stardust Lord I ask you to help us to break the lies of the deceiver and the father of lies who has gotten people to believe you don't exist and that your word is not true. So Lord, I ask you to help us to go out this week, be salt and light, stand strong on the truth of God, be your church. And all God's people said, amen. amen. Why don't you guys go ahead and stand up? We'll break out of here. 12.04. Uh, it's not really 12.04. But it's not too bad, not too bad. You guys have a great week in the Lord. I will be praying for you. I pray for you always, but sometimes a lot of you, your mind, your picture pops in my head, so I know God has me praying for you. I seek to pray for you guys throughout the week and think about you. And so I pray that this week you go out, be salt and light. Thank you, those that are visiting with us. And uh, any questions, please come and talk to us. But... Uh, I want you guys to have a great week in the Lord. And we'll see you next Sunday when it's sunny and warm. All right. So let's break out of here as Team Jesus. Let's go onto the playing field of the world and do our best for our Lord and Savior. On the count of three, we'll break out. One, two, three. Let's go. <laughs>